I'm a Baptist, but I want to be a charismatic. I've always wanted to be a charismatic. And um, the Lord, you know, has been kind to me over the years, but I, I don't speak in tongues. And, and I think most charismatics do. I, I think that's like, the, you know, to be a card-carrying Pentecostal or charismatic, you need to uh, speak in tongues. I'm not, I don't really think that's necessary, but it's common. I wonder, are there any Pentecostals or charismatics here? Okay. Well, uh, I want to be more like you. Um, and this uh, discussion today and tomorrow is just kind of, you know, it's partly my journey in uh, seeking the Lord over the years that I've been a Christian, since 18 years old, um, as a psychologist. And I, I've been interested in the heart, of course. I mean, all Christians are interested in the heart. It's a part of Christianity. Christianity is a religion of the heart. Many Many people have observed that. Particularly the teachings of Jesus make clear how important the heart is. But the whole Bible, as we'll talk about tonight some, uh, is about the heart. And I became a psychologist in training uh, in 1986. I went to Michigan State University, a public university uh, in in Michigan, a state in the United States. And... um, Before that, actually, I had been doing some research on on the heart, uh, qualitative research, where I interviewed people about what are the most important things in your life? Things, persons, activities. What do you, what do you, what's really important in life to you? And I tried to map a person's, the, the topography of their loves and hates, what they really love and what they really hate. And, um, and, I, and, and, and then I stopped that project. Um, and, and for many years, I've been teaching psychology and counseling at various Christian universities uh, and uh, a couple of Christian universities and a, a seminary. I was at a a seminary for 17 years. And during that time, I most of that time, I, I kind of conformed to modern psychology's structure and um, just kind of its, its agenda and the rules of psychology. I, I personally believe, as I suspect all of us do, that Christians need to be involved in their culture. And, uh, you know, we, we need to, to be separate enough so that we can follow the Lord with a clean conscience and, and love God and live for him, ultimately. But we also need to be participating in our culture and not withdraw so much that we don't influence our culture at all. And I felt, I believe I was called into the field of psychology so that I could have that kind of, some kind of impact in the field of psychology. But, but as a result of my graduate training at Michigan State, I began to be conformed to the rules of modern psychology, you know, and, and I became pretty conscientious about following those rules and then teaching psychology according to those rules. Now, at the same time, um, the way that the Lord crafted me, uh, I, I, was, I was a pagan, you know, a, a atheist. Before I was a Christian, I lived a wild hippie life. I was one of the last of the hippies. Um, and uh, I got my girlfriend pregnant when I was 16 years old. And that was a devastating event uh, t- for me as a young teenager. Um, and, uh, but, but that was my life. I had no, no use for God at that time. And um, so when I became a Christian, it was a pretty radical conversion, and I was in social work for a while uh, in some in some Christian ministries and, and one non-Christian ministry, a drug abuse treatment center for teenagers. Um, but I also worked in prison ministry. And along the way, I began to realize that, there, that 
psychology needed more Christian influence. And, and, and so I got, an, uh, I got a couple of other degrees, the, uh, the most important of which was at Michigan State, my, my PhD in, in educational psychology. And I uh, hoped to be a teacher, a professor of psychology at Christian schools. So I, I entered the field of psychology with a desire both to really learn the rules of psychology but also to bring a Christian influence into the field. And I remember early on uh, getting an article rejected because I had a Christian interpretation of a psychological phenomenon um, at the end. And they said, remove that and we'll publish it. And that was, a, that was a difficult decision for me to make. I prayed about it and consulted with my mentors and decided to take out that Christian uh, conclu interpretive conclusion for the article, and true to their word, they did publish it, so long as it didn't have Christianity in it. Um, but that was when I began to think, you know, I'm, I'm going to probably have to concentrate uh, my influence in the church because the world isn't ready for a Christian psychology yet. And, um, and, and I, I knew I was going to teach in a Christian context, which I wanted to, I, wanted, I felt called to do. But I stopped publishing for the, for the I, I didn't publish anything in a secular, I didn't even submit after my dissertation was finished. Uh, and, and I submitted one article which was rejected just on the merits of the article. Um, but then I just decided I'm gonna focus my attention on the church and I published journal articles in Christian journals of psychology and, and, um, and then began writing books eventually, editing and writing books in Christian from a Christian approach to psychology. Um, but, but throughout that teaching time, I really tried, for the most part, to teach psychology as it was understood to be in our culture, in, at least in American culture. There are some differences between uh, European culture and uh, American culture in psychology, as you may know. Uh, unfortunately, from what I can tell, um, the, the strength of European psychology is being diminished by the influence, the overwhelming influence of the, in the last 30, 40 years of American psychology to the detriment of European psychology, in my opinion. Uh, I'd, I'd be happy to talk about that with any of you after or during a break uh, where, where I'm coming from when I say that. But uh, I've become persuaded increasingly, well, throughout my life, I've been working on the project of a Christian psychology and um, seeking to, to uh, present that uh, to my students and in my books and articles. But what I didn't realize is just how much I was still influenced by mainstream secular psychology. After working on it for 25, 30 years, COVID, uh, I experienced a kind of awakening as a result of the, the, the shutdown in American culture I began doing additional reading that I had not been doing quite so conscientiously. And, and much of it, the majority of it, has been directed on the heart. I've been just reading a lot of different sources on, on the heart. And uh, began doing some research during this time. And um, I actually presented uh, uh, and uh, I gave a presentation last year at the American Psychological Association on the subject of a psychology of the heart. Some of that I'm going to present, a little bit of that I'm going to present today. But, uh, you know, since then I've been working more on that subject. I'm presenting again on a psychology of the heart uh, in, in uh, August at the American Psychological Association. Um, and, but this time I'm being a little bit more notorious because I invited a Muslim psychologist to, uh, to have a dialogue with me about a psychology of the heart because Muslims also have an interest of, in, in, uh, in the heart. Uh, it's a part of the, the, the Western theistic tradition going back to the Hebrew scriptures, as you're all, probably all aware, and I'm going to share a little bit of that today. Um, so I, uh, I, I'm, I'm really happy to be presenting this material um, I, in a form that, it, that, is, that I've never presented it before because um, it's that fresh, it's that new. Like I have a pen 
And I hope I brought some paper. I did. Because the odds of, uh, of us through the course of our conversations today or tomorrow, us saying something new that I need to write down are pretty high in my opinion. And I'll wanna to jot ideas down as they occur to me or to you um, that, uh, that will just help me because I'm, it's that alive for me. Um, I haven't published anything on this, but I, Lord willing, I hope to do a couple of books on this subject before I die, Lord helping me. Uh, and uh, some articles as well. Um, so um, that's a little bit of the backstory of what I'm doing here. Um, I am a professor at the Gideon Institute of Christian Psychology and Counseling. Can you imagine? There's actually an Institute of Christian Psychology and Counseling. And, Houston, Texas, affiliated with Houston Baptist University. Now, it, it, it does so happen that there are some Europeans also interested in uh, Christian psychology. In fact, there's an organization that has a wonderful website and a whole bunch of copies of their, of their journal, their magazine journal. The organization is called the European Movement of Christian Anthropology, Psychology, and Psychotherapy. It's quite a name. MCAP, I just say MCAP. MCAP. E-M-C-A-P-P. -P. But let me say it again. The European Movement of Christian Anthropology, Psychology, and Psychotherapy. And I encourage you to go to that website sometime this week and check out their, their uh, copies of their journal. Um, there's a dear friend of mine that's been the editor of that. In fact, I'm going. To, my wife and I are going to be visiting. He and his wife uh, uh, next week after the conference. His name is Werner Mai, and he was one of the founders of Ignis, the Institute for Christian Psychology in Kitzingen, Germany. So there's there's an Institute for Christian Psychology in in Deutschland, and uh, wonderful people there. They're 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 charismatics. Uh, tremendous, just a great group of people, and uh, they've had an impact on me uh, over the years. I got to know them about 15 years ago. Um, but I'm so excited because just three years ago, we started the Gideon Institute of Christian Psychology and Counseling, and, and uh, we're, we're, we have master's programs that lead to licensure in the state of Texas in psychology and counseling. And uh, we're trying to teach our students the best of secular psychology because you need that. You need to know that stuff. Um, but, but within a Christian context where there's actually distinctively Christian psychology theory and research and counseling practice that we're training our students to do. And I, I think it, it's, the, it's the only institute of its kind in in America uh, and in North America, and I think it may be the only master's granting pro Christian program of its kind in the world. I think that's true. Ignis, unfortunately, because of German uh, educational policy, was Ignis was never given the right to grant bachelor's degrees or master's degrees, unfortunately. But anyway, happy to talk about any of that um, while, while I'm here with any of you or any of your friends or relatives that you think might be interested in uh, any of our programs. That's part of why I'm here, of course. Part of my journey that I wasn't very explicit about is over the course of my Christian life, more and more I've moved from being a head-only Christian. A Christian philosopher uh, named James K. Smith uh, says that a Western culture, um, Western culture's view of humanity is that we're heads on a stick. And that's a little exaggeration, uh, particularly uh, compared to Europe. That really fits America and, and, and the Anglo-American, the, yeah, the English scene, I think, Anglo-American, philosophy and psychology is very, very much intellectual as well as uh, 
but, but it's also been a burden of evangelicalism, I think. And, and over the decades, more and more, I've been following the, unwittingly the dictum of Eastern Orthodoxy, uh, which I don't mean to be offensive to any of you who have had a, a really rough time growing up in Eastern Orthodox context. I don't know anything about them, but I've been told at ELF that things are different in Europe than they are in the United States. But in, in the United States, Eastern Orthodox Christians um, are, are uh, very faith-driven, and uh, same with the Catholic Christians that I know. They're not all of them. But um, they're, you know, I'm a Baptist, and I, you know, there's plenty of Baptists who aren't very faith-oriented. Um, so it's much more of a mixture. Um, and so I'm, I speak appreciatively of Eastern Orthodoxy and Roman Catholicism in, in, uh, in, in, my, in my teaching, because the stuff that I read that they're doing, and some of them are therapists that I know, is fantastic. It's, it's, it's fantastic. It's better than any Baptist stuff that I'm aware of in America. So I, I don't mean to, I'm not speaking of your cultural context. It might be very different. All, all I'm saying is that in, in my context, some of the best psych Christian psychology being done in America is done by Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic folks. You know, life is very surprising. And, and uh, um, so, uh, I, so I was going to quote something that I learned from an Eastern Orthodox therapy book that I read that taught me that uh, Eastern Orthodoxy says the goal of the Christian life is that we would descend with our heads into our hearts. And I've come to really like that understanding of the Christian life. I think it's, it, it really is very, very helpful. And what that means is over the decades is I've become very, I'm seeking to become increasingly experiential in my Christianity. When I was a young Christian, I tended to be more intellectually oriented, alone. I'm still fairly intellectual, I think. I probably am. At least my students complain about that too much. I'm trying to learn you know, how, to, how to reach the students that I have in my classes better and better. Um, and I, I have a very, very thick theology that undergirds my psychology. You won't see as much of it here as you would if you read my books. But I, my biggest book is, no kidding, it's this thick. I'm, I'm just explaining to you that I'm very theological. It's, uh, it's called, one of them is called God and Soul Care. And it's this thick, and it's a theology for Christian counseling. That's the purpose of the book. It, it was to, to provide a theology that grounds Christian psychology and counseling. And so I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm still very intellectual. I'm very theologically oriented. And I, I'm very grateful to God for the training that I got, first at a Bible college and then at Calvin College, uh, where I, I, I and, and, then, and then I taught at a seminary for 17 years, and it was the best thing for me because I just, I just lapped up all the theology I could while I was still teaching modern psychology and seeking to transform modern psychology into something different. Not, not even, I wouldn't even say that that's what I was doing. Trying to develop a Christian psychology by retrieving the great uh, biblical and theological resources of the Christian traditions, um, but, but in conversation with modern psychology because they've done a lot of good things. And, I, and I, whatever is true in what they've discovered belongs to God, and I want to claim it for him in a Christian psychology, but it's going to be different. It's going to be pretty different. And over the last two years, it's, I've become even more radical. I mean, I'm, a little, I'm starting to get a little bit worried that I'm going to be so radical that everybody will think I'm weird, you know. Um, but anyway, that's, uh, it, it feels like my calling, you know, over the, over the decades. It, it seems fitting to me that today and tomorrow that this not just be heads talking to heads. Co you know, a cognitive psych psychological or an edu a purely educational experience. I hope it's educational. I think you'll probably agree by tomorrow at one that it was educational. Um, but I want it to be experiential too. Because Christianity is necessarily experiential. 
And I'll talk about that as we go through it. And then last point is introduction is um, sometimes I can talk quickly. And I know that cross-cultural communication requires slowness of speech. So please just remind me to slow down or to repeat myself if, if I said something that you missed, the gist of it. Um, my goal in life is to be a friend to people. And you would honor me by interrupting me to help me be a better teacher. So please feel free, please feel invited to, to be my friend and help me when I need it, okay? All right. So tonight, we're gonna to talk about the biblical and Christian grounds for a psychology of the heart. The term heart is used in three main ways in the English language. I'm, I'd be very curious about your languages. I'm not kidding. I want to do some cross-cultural research by tomorrow, maybe after one o'clock. All of you that might have something to share for me, share with me from your language system, let's, let's get together, okay? So, so be thinking about this, please. Um, so the, the most obvious reference of the word heart the English word heart, is it's a physical organ that's continuously keeping humans and most animals alive by pumping blood through our circulatory system, the heart. So is there a more important organ than the heart? Thank you. Yeah, because guess what? Why, why did you say the brain? Yeah. No brain working, no heart working. So the brain is really, really important. But what I want to do is I want to suggest that the heart, well, I would say those two organs, if we can call the brain an organ, I don't know if we can, um, those are the two most important organs in our bodies. We need both of them to be alive. And so the heart is super important. And, and we've known that the heart is important since... Human, humans became aware of their bodies and how their bodies are keeping them alive. I don't know when, we don't know when that happened exactly, but it had to have been thousands of years ago. And so we've known how important the heart is. We haven't known how important the brain is. You know, there were some Romans, a Roman physician named Galen, who knew the brain was the seat of rationality. My recollection is. So, so there were some people who knew that the brain was really important, but most people didn't know how important the brain was until the last 100 years, 150 years, and especially the last 30 years where we're living in an absolute revolution of brain knowledge. It's, it's fantastic and phenomenal. The problem is, is that it's making us even more focused on the head rather than the heart. And that's a problem, I think, because the heart's so important. Anyway, the heart's important as a physical organ. We all know that. And we know that really young. I don't know. I'd like to do some research on, on children's awareness of their hearts, physical heart, because now that's kind of important to me. But there's also a psychological heart. And that's what I'm going to be talking about for the most part. The psychological heart is a, is a metaphor. It's a special kind of metaphor that's called in English a metonymy, which means that it's connected to the physical heart in some, in some sort of mysterious way. It's located in the chest, do you think? I don't know what you think. I'd like to hear you, you know. Um, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to tell you what my, my opinion is, and I've done some research on it. Um, for example, I, I've interviewed 25 Christian academics in America and asked them to spend an hour telling me what they think the heart is. And all of them, not all of them, but most of them point to something going on in the chest. I don't even know if most of them do, but some of them do. Anyway, I shouldn't say most of them. I haven't tabulated that. I'm going to, just right now, we're going to talk more and more about this. 
but I'm going to call it an evaluative organ. It's a metaphor. It's an organ in the soul. Bear with me. I'm going to be covering some new territory, maybe, um, for all of us, you know. Um, but but that's that would be my understanding of what we're doing with the uh, in English at least with the word uh, heart when we use it a lot of the time. And this evaluative organ interprets, guides, and unifies human life in a way that's different than the mind. And uh, so there we have a symbol of the heart. Now, it's beating, and so it's an ambiguous symbol. It could be a symbol of either one, but that's kind of part of the fun of, uh, of our reflecting on the heart because, um, because where one picks up and the other one st starts, well, no, where one picks up and the other one leaves off is hard to tell. And uh, I love playing with that, um, the, the metaphor of uh, the physical heart and the psychological heart. But it's also used as a, a strict uh, metaphor um, that pertains to centrality or depth. In English, for example, we can say, you know, this point here is at the heart of my argument. And there, you see, we're using the word heart in a way that doesn't refer to anything about my body or my soul but rather it's a metaphor referring to something that's central or maybe deep in an argument. The second use is an example of what some psychologists have called lay psychology. Since it refers to a psychological construct that's distinct from the mind, but similar to the mind, and psychologists do refer to the mind fairly frequently. Now, I wish I had more time to teach you know, a whole seminar for a whole semester on this stuff, but just so you know, real quickly, I, I use the word soul as the term that, dis, that refers to the immaterial part of us in contrast to the body. And I'm not, good Christians disagree about these things. They're very controversial. I'm not going to teach on it because it, it, I don't want to get lost in, that, in those arguments. I'm just explaining to you where I'm coming from so you can follow what I'm saying. Um, but I, I would use the term soul and, and, um, and spirit to refer to the immaterial aspect of human beings that is always united with the body while we're alive. The mind and heart are also terms that can be used synonymously with soul and spirit. And those are the four big psychological terms. There are others, but those are the four most common ones in the Bible. And they're very common in the English language, those four. And I, I, I suspect there's analogs in, in all the languages represented here. But is there such a thing as a psychological heart? A thing. Like we know there's a thing we can point to in our chest that's physical, that's a physical heart. But is there such a thing as a psychological heart um, that's immaterial? You see, psychology by definition, is, is the understanding of the soul. Psuche is the Greek word for soul, and I, I, there are different, uh, different um, beliefs about when the term psychology was invented, but at least one person traced it back to the Lutheran theologian Melanchthon in the 1500s, that he used the word psychology to refer to understanding or study of the soul. And of course, back then, people believed in souls. One of the ironies of modern psychology is that 
They rejected belief in a soul as an actually existing something. And some Christians have agreed with that. I'm, I'm a little more traditional uh, in that. I, I believe that the body and the soul are two aspects of, one, of the one human person. Um, so I, I do believe there's a soul, but I also would go so far as to say that the soul seems to have some structure to it. Even though it's immaterial, and it's very different from our bodily structure, which you study in the field of anatomy. See, I would liken psychology, at least personality psychology, to the study of anatomy in the field of medicine, the study of the, the body's structure. But the soul has structure too. Thinking, feeling, choosing, relationship. And, and those, those structures develop through the course of our lives, and our souls become increasingly complicated. I don't understand the metaphysics of, of our souls. I don't. I don't know how God does it. I don't know how it works that we can be born or conceived with a soul. You know, it's, it's very, you know, either at conception or shortly thereafter, we're given a soul by God, and it's joined to our bodies until we die. And I, I, don't, I, I don't understand all of that, and, and I don't understand how that soul grows in complexity. All I know is that the science of psychology tries to study that structure, which grows in increasing complexity. Um, for example, all of us have a schema, that's, a, that's a, just a term for a, a single psychological structure in our minds, a schema. All of us have a schema for the person known as Vladimir Putin. And what's attached to that schema are all the beliefs that we have about him, and maybe some emotions associated with him. Um, that's, that's a psychological structure that none of us had before 1980. Well, of course, some of you were maybe born in 1980. But uh, I didn't know of Vladimir Putin be, you know, before 1980, so I didn't have that structure in my mind, but I do now, and it's fairly well elaborated as it, as it is in your minds. So you see what I mean by it ha our minds, our souls have a kind of structure to them, but it's immaterial. But it can still be studied in various ways. Well, I know this is a little, this is, you, you just see how we can kind of really get off um, there's so much complexity here, and I don't want to, this isn't a, this isn't a, a graduate seminar in, in psychology, but uh, I, I wanted to explain a little bit of where I'm coming from. So, for the most part, soul, spirit, mind, and heart are synonyms. They overlap. And so, it is a structure of the mind. And so when I say it's a structure of the mind, I mean it's a structure of the soul. I don't know any other way of making sense of the immaterial aspect because I, I think the immaterial aspect is one. But just like our body is one, but composed of many parts, which we can study in anatomy, so psychology is the study of the different parts or aspects, no, sorry, the different parts of the immaterial aspect, which I'm... Most of the time, I'm going to call a soul. Now, there are some, some sub-uses of these terms that you find. So often, not often, but some of the time, the use of spirit in the Bible is referring to our relationship with God more than some of the other terms. The term mind, you can't find the original, Hebrew, there's no Hebrew word for mind. It was, it was one of the others. You know, ruach, um, uh, oh, spirit. No, that's is that ruach? And soul, nefesh. Thank you, nefesh. And uh, and heart is uh, lev. So those three Hebrew words pretty much are the are the main Hebrew words for the internal immaterial part of us. And uh, heart's the most important according to Old Testament theologian um, Hans Wolf. 
But, but the point is, is that they're overlapping in their uses. You know, the, the, but the biblical authors didn't write, didn't, didn't come up with a systematic psychology. That's not what lay psychology is. Lay psychology is gloriously messy. And that's its strength as well as its weakness. And I'm a big proponent of, of lay psychology and, of course, the psychology of the Bible. So I want to be as accurate as I can. And if, you've, if there's anything that I say that's questionable, please raise your hand or talk to me about it after. Because um, I want to really be faithful to, to, the, uh, to Scripture. But, um, but mind in the New Testament sometimes tends to refer to our thoughts more than the other aspects, and then our word heart in, in the Old and New Testaments seems to refer to something deep in us some of the time. So that's kind of how I make sense of it. So a schema is in all four, in, in, a, in a way, because they're, they're one thing, the immaterial. So I'm just going to cover this really quickly because you're not going to believe how much material I have on this, this PowerPoint that we won't be looking at, um, well, you may if you've already gone through it. But, but this is kind of important and it's what I've already been just talking about. Why hasn't the second use of heart, a common lay psychology term, been a focus of modern psychology, whereas the mind has been thoroughly investigated? And I want to explain a little bit why there are really good reasons why modern psychology ignores the heart. Some of them are biased, I think, but some of them are really good. The available neurological evidence points us to the brain as where most of the activity happens in the soul. And um, it has not drawn much attention to the physical heart, to that region of the chest that's associated with the psychological heart. Modern psychology's discovery of brain function have consistently demonstrated that the mind's activities are located within the skull. And most of what we've learned about the psychological functions of the heart, what we call the heart in everyday language, like the emotions, point in the same direction. What part of the brain is responsible for emotions? Largely. Anybody know? Limbic system. And yeah, parts of the cerebral cortex, but especially the limbic system. So that's up here. It's not down here. And so I think, honestly, I, I have a, a, a huge challenge ahead of me. Like, like most psychologists would think this is nonsense, talking about the heart. They, they've proven that there is no such thing as a heart, and lay, lay psychology is wasting its time referencing the heart. As a result, the psychological heart is considered exclusively metaphorical, a pervasive literary symbol, cultural symbol, but nothing worthy of scientific attention. Complicating matters further, the West has long had a bias towards the mind, beginning in ancient Greece. And that continued through the Middle Ages with some modifications, and then it just took off in the modern era. Descartes is a very important figure in the telling of the story of what went wrong with modernism in my, my telling of the story. And because of that influence of, of modernity on the church, Christians in the modern era, have also tended to emphasize rationality, objectivity, conscious awareness, Bible knowledge, reading the Bible intellectually, education being the primary way of changing people, educating their minds. And they've been skeptical. Many Christians, maybe you have, been taught to be skeptical of the heart, as I was, and, and taught for many years. The emotions, desires, feelings, subjectivity. Ooh, that's a bad word in, in some circles, subjectivity. The body, human experience, intuition, the unconscious. Reading the Bible experientially. 
and inner transformation, believing that sin is far more dangerous in these murky realms of the heart than they are in the mind. Does that resonate with any of you? See, the charismatic movement and Pentecostal movements, you know, we're, we're don't fit this quite so, so well. There's, there's parts of them that do, but, but they were definitely after subjective experience as a part of the Christian life. But I'm a Baptist, and we Baptists, we love education. We love Bible education. And there's a place for that. God knows I'm thankful. I'm so thankful for my Bible education. But, you know, the Holy Spirit wouldn't let that be enough, you know, in my own journey, and maybe yours too. And I, I came to feel more and more that my mind and my heart are supposed to become one. They're not supposed to be dissociated the way that they have become in the modern era. Evangelicals don't reject the word heart, but many tend to regard the heart as if it were the mind, and so consider church life and counseling to be largely a function of education and volition, making the right choices, which is important. And so we tend to promote the learning of intellectual truth and the performance of behavior in many evangelical churches, rather than promoting equally and maybe even, I could say even further, Christian experience and action and the renewal of human subjectivity, which is, which is, I would say, more important than the mind. Now, let me, you know, just to be really, really clear, I value the mind. If you knew me, if you read anything by me, you'd say, oh, this guy's way too intellectual, you know. So I love the mind, and, and I believe it's really important. But what I want to suggest is I think Christianity teaches us that the mind is only first base. Oh, this is a, an American uh, metaphor of baseball. <laughs> it, it's only getting um, partway on the journey, the first step, catechism, catechesis, learning what the Bible teaches, what the Christian faith teaches. That's very important. But we should know that within two or three years of our Christian life. And maybe we learned it in church. And if we learned it well, praise God. We need to know the Bible. We need to learn the truth of Scripture. Please don't doubt that throughout the rest of our talk because I believe it with all my heart. I just don't want to be left there or maybe even put it stronger. I don't want to get stuck in there, stuck in my mind because God doesn't want me just to think his thoughts after him. God wants me to love him. And truth is a means to knowing and loving God. It's, a, it's further down the journey. Love, I'm sorry, love is further down the journey. Now, I don't really mean it's temporal. That, that's, that's messed up. They, they interact with each other all the time. But all I'm saying is it's really easy to, to learn stuff in our minds it's much more challenging to learn such things like the Christian, like, like the truths of the Christian life, to learn them in our hearts, where they, they cause us to delight in the truth of, that they point to. That's a, different, that's, that's, that's a different thing that's, that's based on the truth of our knowledge. Calvin said that the Bible provides our spectacles. I, I, uh, I need reading glasses. And then I can read more clearly. I can see the world, at least reading closely, um, more clearly when I have my glasses on. And um, Calvin, that's a beautiful metaphor for what the Bible's purpose is. It, we're called upon to take seriously the psychology of the Bible because it provides what I call the first principles of the most scientific psychology we can come up with, which my goal, and I assume it's yours too, to the degree that you're called to do what I'm going to say here, is we, want the, we Christians, we want a psychology that conforms most closely to God's psychology. And the problem is he didn't reveal that in its totality anywhere, including the Bible. 
But he gave us the first principles, the most important truths in the universe are in that Bible. And so let's go to it and study it to, to draw from them what are the big you know, pillars of truth that we need to know, know, that we need as our glasses to study anything. Biology, you know, archaeology, chemistry, uh, psychology, history, theology for sure. The Bible sheds more light on, on theology and psychology than it does chemistry, of course. You know? but, but even chemistry is implicitly embedded in some of the references in the Bible. In Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Chemistry is related to Jesus. And the, a Christian chemist needs to strive to, to understand that in his daily chemistry life. Uh, or he's going to become an, a practical atheist, and he'll never think about Jesus while he's working in his laboratory. And that's not good for a Christian. So my goal is to go to the Bible, to begin there. I begin with the Bible in a way, uh, in, in, in a Christian psychology, and then to read the Bible to help us develop whatever discipline we're working on, whatever we're exploring. And I would say the Bible gives us the following principles. Number one, a biblical, psych biblical psychology terms are fuzzy concepts. They overlap. They're not discrete concepts that are clearly demarcated from one another, which is the goal of, of most scientific psychology, especially modern psychology. They point us towards in the Bible, they point us, psychology terms point us towards wholeness, the whole person, not division, not analysis, not breaking down into component parts. As important as that is, which I love modern psychology, um, but modern psychology has erred in, go, in, in so much focusing on the breaking down of everything into component parts that they have no goal towards which we are to move what we used to call a telos, the telos of our lives, the end for which we were made. That's super important in a Christian psychology and super important in the Bible. And that's just because of the influence of positivism in modern psychology, that's, they won't talk about it. Even positive psychology, I'm sorry if that term is misleading, um, but they don't have an overarching view of what the whole person is moving, is to move towards. What's the simplest Christian answer to what's the goal of human life? There's a lot of them, but what comes to mind? To glorify God, to glorify God yes. And enjoy, and enjoy Him forever. That's wonderful. Um, what's another one that's like basically a synonym in a way, but but different. Worship. worship, yes. Now those are those are activities, and I'm talking about. Oh, this is no. I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to say the same thing. I'm going to come up with an activity. But there's a phrase in the New Testament Paul uses called conformity to Christ. That's just another description. So saying the same thing, and there's a hundred different ways of describing that telos, that goal. But that's really important. That gives our life meaning. It unifies our souls, all those processes that we have inside of us. It brings them together. And that's the focus of, of Scripture's psychology. New, New Testament psychology will be more complex than Old Testament psychology. This is just a third principle of when we go to the Bible, we need to keep this in mind. One of the reasons we know, one of the ways we can say that is, the term mind hadn't been developed yet in the Hebrew, in, in near, ancient Near Eastern languages, to my knowledge. I'm happy to be proven wrong. But my understanding is the term nous and noesis uh, came out of the Greek tradition, and the Christianity inherited that, and the New Testament then started to use those terms. Um, thought. Thought, yes. They, well, uh, I, in the Hebrew Bible? I'm not, I'm not sure they did. I, I would be very surprised if they did, but I, I, I'm happy to be, we could. And the idea of when I consider the work of your hands, for example, in the Psalms, that idea of considering, and I don't know if the word would be called, but right. the processes at least. Thank there. you. The processes are acknowledged, yes. My, my only point here is the word like lave 
in, in, in an early language system like Hebrew is there's just fewer words. One of the glories of cultural development is our, all vocabularies grow, at least if they're exposed to where the growing is happening. And so we just have a lot more words now than we used to have. So the word lay for heart would be used for thinking, choosing, feeling, but we didn't have those words, thinking, feeling, choosing, back then. We had lave. That at least, and again, I could be wrong. I'm happy to be, you know, but, but that's my understanding. And I've read some in, in Old Testament theology to try and track some of that down. But please. Your heart is Voss, yeah. Yeah, I love that guy. And he, see, he said that the Bible is the um, progressive revelation of God uh, over time. And so there's more revelation in the, in the New Testament than there is in the Old. And then lastly, uh, we find that there are some uses of heart that are unique and that tend to focus towards um, depth. Now, let me just say what, what changed in me to start taking heart ever more seriously was when I read Jonathan Edwards' Religious Affections, an amazing book um, that made me aware that the affections, the emotions of the Christian life are, according to Edwards, non-negotiable. They're, they're necessary to true Christianity. In fact, they are the signs of true religion, he called them. He said, true doctrine is not a sign of true religion. You can know lots of true doctrine. Now, he would say true doctrine is necessary to true religion. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. We need, we need religious affections because, what I said before earlier today, that if we, if we know the truth, then we're gonna, we're gonna, our, our hearts will be activated by the truth. And we'll feel uh, a resonance in our hearts when we're thinking about truth, we're thinking about God and his nature. All right. So the heart is the dominant psychological term in the Hebrew and Christian scriptures, according to Hans Wolf. Um, that's, that's a book, uh, what's it called? I think it's called Anthropology of the Old Testament, but I might be wrong about that. It occurs over a thousand times, 800 in the Old Testament. Isn't that amazing? And here are some great verses. I can't read all of them for time's sake. Hear my son and be wise and direct your heart in the way. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart, the inner person. The term heart is often in the Old Testament associated with uh, that connotation of inner, the inner self. Ah, this famous one. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I just had a couple weeks ago, I was talking about this in one of my classes, and, and a student kind of challenged me and said, well, why is that verse in there if, if what you're saying, if, if the heart is, is, is not just deceitful? And I, my response was, this is one verse. It's only one verse out of 800 in the Old Testament. It's an important verse. I... I I believe the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, but so is the mind. And that's because sin has corrupted all of our faculties. And all of them, we need to be careful with how we interpret and make sense of our minds, our hearts, um, our spiritual inclinations, and so on. And it is hard to know our hearts. That's a, that's a truism, and our, part of the reason why Christians affirm this is because sin has clouded our hearts. But that doesn't mean has made it impossible to understand. And we erred as a Christian community to the degree that we concluded, not going to go into my heart, because if we don't go into our hearts, we cannot grow as a Christian. How about this one as the alternative, which is also in Jeremiah, a little ironically. God promised to make a new covenant with his people. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. At least being a Christian, 
we ought to be more open to our hearts. Maybe those pagans can't trust their hearts at all, but at least we have the work of the Holy Spirit writing God's word on our hearts, which when he says his law, that means he's changing our hearts so that we can obey him better. And how do we do that? Well, in part, it's learning how to love him better because obedience always proceeds more easily from a loving heart than a dutiful heart. You know what I mean by that? Obedience always proceeds more easily from a loving heart than from a dutiful heart. Now, sometimes duty is all we got. My heart is sometimes dead to the Lord. It feels dead. There's no emotion happening. Please don't think I'm, you know, all emotional. You know, I am somewhat emotional and maybe more than some of you. But there are times when I feel as dead as a stone in my heart. So, but I want more and I seek the Lord and I pray about my heart. And there's that, I don't think I have it up here, but search me, O God, Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart and see if there be any wicked way in me because I can't trust myself very well in the Old Testament. I haven't been given the Holy Spirit yet because I'm in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit was given at Pentecost to all the people of God and he was only given to some people in the, in the, in the Old Testament. And so... Um, the, the psalmist prays, search me, O God, and know my heart and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So the goal is, God, I need your help down here. It's murky. It's cloudy. I know there's sin in there. Help me sort it out. Help me to become wiser in what's going on down there so that I can love you more. That, I think, is the trajectory of the Bible from Old to New Testament. How about this one? I, this is my therapy verse. If I ever get an office uh, for, just for therapy, I'm going to put this as a banner over the doorway. Pour out your heart like water before the presence of the Lord. We also learn that the Lord has a heart. Now, how about that? The Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. And we know that it isn't the physical heart. God's got a psychological heart because God's immaterial, at least until the incarnation. And those are, the, those are the Old Testament verses. I'm gonna, I'd like to just go through this list and then we'll, we'll stop for tonight. It's not that many, but it's so wonderful. You know, and most of them are very familiar to you. In the New Testament, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Is heart important in the Christian psychology? We better figure out what the heart is in the Christian psychology. Modern psychology is not going to be much help. It will give us some good in research on emotions and other things, but it won't talk about the heart. Now here's another one that evangelicals have pointed to with good reason. It is out of the heart that we're defiled. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. But that doesn't mean the heart's bad and the mind is good. They're both created by God. And they're both fallen. And they're both being redeemed in Christians. Yes. We're being given a new heart. That's the promise of the new covenant. It just, Jeremiah didn't know it took a lifetime. Does that make sense? I don't have time to unpack that, but that's what I think is embedded in Jeremiah's prophecy. But, but the point here is, yeah, the heart's super... Jesus is saying your heart is really important. Don't think that just because you've got good doctrine and you go to synagogue every week, that everything's okay. He was, a, he was a psychologist of the heart, in part, because the Pharisees were the, the foil, because they lived in their heads. And they're behavior. And Jesus is awakening his people to a deeper life. Hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts. The heart is a container. 
It's a metaphor that the Bible uses a lot. The heart is a container. Think of it as a container. And through the Holy Spirit, God's love is being poured into it. I hope you tasted a little bit of that tonight. God has shown in our hearts the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's where the action is, folks. God has shown in our hearts the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We need that knowledge can only get to our hearts through our minds. Our minds are an essential, necessary part of that process. I'm not making light of the mind. Oh, no. It's just... That's the first step. And then we want it to go deeper. Paul prayed that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Oh, brother, sister, may the Lord help us to know what that phrase means. He can dwell in your hearts through faith. By faith, opening up our hearts to him. Christ is there. Love one another deeply, Paul says, from the heart. Not just out of duty. So yes, it's true. Christians have been skeptical of the heart. And those verses are important, but the heart is even more important than the mind in a biblical psychology. It's just more important. It's not that the mind is unimportant. But we've gotten stuck in the mind, I think, in, in the 20th century. The 20th century was a hard century for God's people. And we got stuck in the minds. And, and what God wants to do is to keep, have it keep going. Because he's into whole soul renewal. And, and to bring that back into the center of biblical and Christian counseling. Um, pastoral counseling, I include under that. Uh, in our own spiritual journeys with the Lord.